Great. All right, so I'm going to talk to you guys today a little bit about uh, dynamical systems in neuroscience. Um, and I'm just going to preface this by saying this is a very sort of general overview. Um, there's a lot of specifics that you can get into when you deal with these sort of dynamical systems and models. And it's, you know, hopefully I'll get you past the sort of steep part of the learning curve at first, and then when you go to apply it to your own data and analysis that you, you can then master the sort of more complicated portions of it. Um, okay, so just a brief outline of what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, first, I'm going to just have a brief comment on models and how we should think about them, just because I feel sometimes people really don't understand what a model is, is really used for. Um, then I'm going to introduce just dynamical systems in general and follow that with a discussion of linear dynamical systems. And then I'm going to introduce a more advanced topic in the sort of um, dynamic system, which is stochastics. And then look at how the probability density of a given variable will evolve over time, given that we have some stochastics. And then I'll uh, talk about a specific model that has become useful in neuroscience. Um, so models. So models are just a way of explaining data and gathering some intuition about what is actually going on. So we might remember this guy, really brilliant person, Newton. And he developed a set of models which explained how, say, gravitation uh, influences how objects fall, right? Well, it turns out that about 300 years later, this other smart guy came along and revised those models and said, hey, that's not quite good enough. Those classical models were wrong, okay? And then shortly after this brilliant man came along, there was another one. And he said, wait, the relativity doesn't actually explain everything. If we go and we look at atoms, or things below the atomic scale. Um, relativity doesn't apply at all, and we have to use a, a different set of tools in quantum mechanics. And it turns out that quantum mechanics can't actually explain relativity either, so he must be wrong. And the point of this isn't for me to you know, point out that all these guys are dumb. In fact, I think they were some of the most brilliant men ever. The point is that the models were not right or wrong. The models are either useful or not useful. And what I mean by that is models can either help you explain data and get insight, or they will not explain data or not provide insight. So always keep that in mind when you are modeling. OK, so that digression aside, um, let's talk about what we mean when we say a dynamical system. It's really quite a, a simple concept. We just have some variable, say x, and that variable might change over time. So if we take some short time step, delta t, x will change by some amount delta x. And we can imagine there's another variable, y. And y actually controls what delta x is through some um, generally nonlinear function f. And so this variable now is controlling how x evolves over time. And we could actually write this another way, or we could actually do the flip of this as well and say x influences y and influences how y evolves over time, right? So that's all a dynamical system is, is we have some variables. They are influenced by each other over time. And we can get out some actually quite complicated behavior. OK, so let's look at the math of this in a little bit more detail. So we had x at some short time later. Delta t later is equal to x plus some value delta x. Doing some simple algebra, we can rearrange this and divide by delta t. And you might notice something here if we take the limit. That's the derivative of x over time, right? So when we talk about dynamic systems, what we're really talking about is a set of differential equations. And these differential equations can be generally nonlinear, um, functions of lots of inputs, and change over time. Um, and so this is pretty much the most general way I can write the change in x, um, although I could add more and more variables. It doesn't matter. OK, so let's uh, examine a really simple system, and that's uh, written here, where the change in x over time is equal to some constant a times what x was before. Rearranging with some algebra, we get all the x terms on one side, integrate, and then 
the output of that integral, we can do some algebra on that, and we arrive at a solution for what x is over time. So take a moment to, to look at what this is. It just says x at some time t is equal to some initial value of x times uh, e to the at, okay? So now this variable a becomes very important. If a happens to be greater than zero, you can imagine that over time this is just going to explode and x goes to infinity, right? If a is less than zero, x will just decay to some constant value. And of course, if a is zero, x won't do much of anything. All right, so this is a really simple system. And it turns out it's about limited to these different solutions that I've shown you. Uh, we can actually get some more complicated behavior. Ah, uh, sorry, this is stable, this is unstable. Um, terminology that might appear in the literature. Um, but we can get some more complicated behavior if we start introducing a second variable, say y. And now we're going to link these two um, through a, b, c, and d. And if we just choose some values, we can actually get out something that looks a lot different, and that's an oscillation over time. Okay, so let's look at a little bit more detail on what's going on here. Um, it turns out that if you think about it, you can write what, how x is changing over time and how y is changing over time at each point in space, x and y, right? And that's all I'm showing you here. Um, I hope you can see it, is the um, these values of these um, derivatives at different points in space. So here in the middle, they're not go going much of anywhere. And here off the sides, they are sort of inducing this, this oscillation that you saw over time. Clear? OK. So you know, just to make the, the point really clear, we can look at a specific point right here where x happens to be negative 1 and y is 0. And we see that at that specific point, x is not changing over time, but y is. We can look at a different point, say, where y is negative 1 and x is 0. And we see now that y isn't changing and x is. So this brings us to a somewhat important concept in dynamical systems, which is the idea of a null cline. And all a null cline is is just the collection of points where a given variable is not changing. So if we look along the horizontal here in that system, we actually see that any point along that, that line, x is not changing over time, and that is the null cline for x. Uh, similarly, we can look at where y doesn't change over time. It happens to be this line here, and that is the null cline for y. Okay, so quick question for understanding. If I just happen to drop my initial conditions here, right on the null cline for y, is, it, is the variable going to change at all? Is x or y going to change at all? It is? Okay, great. So that's absolutely correct. y will change, and you will see that um, sorry, x will change, and you'll see that you'll move this way, and now x and y will change at the same time. So there's only one point here where I could start this, uh, this differential process and that would not change, and that's right in the center where both values are zero, and that's what we call a fixed point. Okay, so these turn out to be pretty important because we can um, analyze fairly complicated dynamical systems by looking at the behavior around the fixed points. OK, so we can also think about this system. Um, well, we can actually write this, this system of equations a little bit differently. And we can just say, hey, we're going to recognize that this is a system of linear equations. And we can write that as a matrix or a vector and a matrix and another vector. And that allows us to just generalize this uh, to an arbitrary number of um, variables where v is a vector of arbitrary length, m controls how v changes over time um, by multiplying by v. OK, so the reason why I've rewritten it this way is it actually turns out you can learn a lot about what the system will do over time by looking at m. So if we, for example, take the eigenvalues of m, we can determine what sort of behavior the system will have. It turns out that if all the eigenvalues are negative, then you'll have this decaying process that we saw before. If any eigenvalue is positive, some of these variables are going to explode and go to infinity. 
And if we have any imaginary eigenvalues, we get oscillations. Okay, so these aren't the only three solutions, but every solution to linear systems will involve some combination of this. So you could have a decaying process that os oscillates a little bit, or you could have an exploding process that oscill oscillates a little bit, um, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so I just want to finish up the basic introduction to dynamical systems by throwing in this caution that you know biological systems aren't really linear in general. And that's okay, because we can actually use linear models to make good approximations, or as I said, um, evaluate what happens near fixed points, and that will help us learn a lot about what the system does. Um, and then if we are really careful and do our work hard, we can come up with some really elegant models that explain a lot. And so this is uh, the Hodgkin and Huxley model for the giant squid axon. And it just explains how the voltage of that axon changes over time by coupling it to a series of other variables. Now, I'm not going to work out the math for this of this for you guys, but just notice that this is a highly nonlinear function of n and m. And it turns out you can get this really cool behavior that mimics spikes. So anyone want to take a guess which one's model and which one's giant squid axon? Can't really, right? Because their the model's really good. And in fact, this one's the model, this one's the data. And again, you know, we shouldn't say this model is right, but what was great about this model is that they were able to infer, based on what they wrote, that the, for example, um, gating variable, n, this represents the number of subunits in the potassium channel. And in fact, every potassium channel that we know has four subunits. I, I might have that wrong, but in general, they have four subunits. Okay, great. So that's the very, very basic introduction to dynamic systems. I'm going to move on now to talk about stochastics because I feel as though that's an important um, element in real science. And all I mean by stochastics is there's a large number of variables that we don't have control over that influence what we're studying, say this variable v. Okay, so it's being influenced by a ton of inputs. Let's just make this concrete by saying this is a, a neuron, and this is the voltage of that neuron, and it's getting lots of inputs because it's a cortical neuron. It gets you know thousands and thousands of inputs. And so we're not going to be able to know what all those inputs are over time, and it, it becomes useful to then break this out and make a model of it and say, well, the voltage is changing mostly due to some driving input i and some random fluctuations eta. And then we can write down the total input to this neuron as i plus eta. Okay. So what is this eta thing? Well, it's a random term that we add to our differential equations. So here on the left, we had our original differential equation. And here on the right, now we've added this eta term. And eta just comes from a Gaussian distribution whose variance scales with the, the time step that you choose, delta t. Um, so I'm going to discuss now a very specific process. Um, it's called the orenstein ollenbach process. And basically, all it is is a linear term on your variable of interest v plus this noise um, term. OK. So how does this? Uh, look like over time if we, we simulate the model. Well, I've plotted, uh, I think, four different trajectories of this model. And as you can see, we can start at the same point, but uh, I'm sorry, actually, I'm going to take a step back. I'm going to set A to 0 here, and we're just going to look at what eta does over time. OK. So we could all start at the same point, but over time, it sort of wiggles and randomly moves away um, towards very different trajectories, right? I hope you guys can see this. It's pretty light. Um, so it no longer is really useful for us to talk about what v is on a given instantiation of this. We want to know more generally what is the probability of v at a given time. All right. So what, what does the distribution of um, voltages, let's say, look like at that, that given point in time? OK. So. Now let's, let's take a look at what this process is doing and, and try to gain some intuition about what that probability distribution will look like. So we can imagine starting this process of uh, 
you know, 100 times in the same spot. And then at some rate, it's going to go to a different point at the next time step, right? That's all the eta term was doing. It's just adding some random noise. And since it's Gaussian, it's going to go to this point very rarely, or that point very rarely. And it's going to go to the middle um, quite often. Um, so now we have a distribution of voltages at the next time step. And we might think, OK, well, we're done. We got our probability distribution at the next time. Turns out that's not quite right. So let's uh, think about that in a little bit more detail. So now I've gone to the next time step, V at delta t. And we're looking at a specific instance here. And we see, OK, well, it spreads out again. Great. So we might think that we've, again, solved this and said we know what this probability distribution should look like based on just eta, right? But it turns out that's not right, because we have to take into account all these other ways that we could go from v at delta t, or at the v when it's at time delta t, to the next time point. So all I'm showing you here is, in fact, the conditional distribution. The distribution of voltages at this time point, given that v was at big V, this red bar, this other time. So now we have to look at you know, this conditional distribution and this conditional distribution, so on and so on. And if we want to know the full distribution of voltages, independent of what v was at the last time step, we actually have to sum up across all the conditional distributions and find the marginal. Right? So hopefully you guys are familiar enough with probability theory that that made sense. OK. Any questions? Great. OK. So this is great, and it works fine. But the, okay, go ahead. Um, I'm not, so what, what do you think is wrong here? So, so here, so this one, I think that this is the, like the you know, condition of probability. And then we also need to find the probability of V equals to VI, right? Yeah, so the that's the probability here. Uh, yeah, I get what you're saying. I, I've sort of swept that under the rug. And it's, it's, this is actually correct in that you've sort of summed up w all these different VIs here, right? So we could, we could talk about that afterwards, but the, the, the main point stands, right? And the, 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 the basic thing is, this is useful in that we can, we can figure out what this probability distribution is. But the problem is we have to enumerate all the paths from uh, t equals 0 to t equals 2 delta t to get to that probability distribution, right? We have to figure out what are all the different bins I have to go through, how do they um, go from this bin to the next one over time, et cetera, et cetera. So it actually becomes a very difficult um, problem to solve computationally. And there's an easier way of uh, thinking about this and actually writing it down. And we can do that by looking at, you know, let's just say we're interested in this one bin where v was equal to big V. And we want to know how the probability changes. So how probable it is that V ended up in that bin at this time. And we want to look at how that changes, right? And we'll, we can figure out how that changes by looking at how often stuff comes into it versus how often stuff leaves. OK, so this is a little bit easier to think about in the limit case where we look at very small steps. So this is representing that uh, bin that we're interested in and the, the pro total probability of being in that bin. And then we can look at these two adjacent bins and ask, how often does something from this bin jump into the center bin? And some, uh, how often does it jump from the right into the center bin? And we can assign some number r over 2 is equal to the rate that it jumps from this bin to the center. Right? Similarly, we can ask how quickly it jumps out. And if we just sort of take all these numbers and write them down. We can say something about how this probability distribution changes over time. 
based on you know, what came in from the left, what came in from the right, and what left from the center. And I'm not going to derive this in any rigorous way. I'm just going to say that if we chose R correctly, we can arrive at this equation down here. And if you remember your introductory calculus, this looks a lot like the second derivative. And in fact, the solution to this equation is the second derivative with respect to V of your probability distribution. And that governs how this d distribution evolves over time. OK, so this is fairly abstract. Let's look at it, what's actually going on here. So the blue line plots the probability distribution at some time t. And the yellow line plots the second derivative of that. And you can see that the, the consequence of this equation is that we're going to take stuff out of the center. That's what this is. And we're going to add it to the sides, right? So basically what will happen to this distribution over time is it's going to go shorter here and widen out. And that's exactly what we saw back here, right? Um, sorry. These trajectories were widening out, or were becoming more wide over time. So um, the general re result of this equation is that the variance of your process, if it's Gaussian, will just increase linearly. And hopefully you guys will do the exercises and be able to see that. Uh, if you take this out to infinity, yes, you have a variance that is infinity as well. Yeah. Okay. Does that mean variance of infinity means uniform? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is just the, the diffusion part of the, the process that we were talking about. There's another part, oops, sorry, and that's the, the drift. So now if we set b equal to zero and just keep the a term, we're back at what we had with the, the sort of ordinary differential equations I started with. And we can start at any initial conditions, and it'll just sort of decay back down to 0, as long as we keep A positive in this case. Right? OK. So we can play the same sort of game, look at what happens in the limit case, how fast stuff jumps from one bin into the bin of interest, and you know, write it back out. And then we arrive at another differential equation. And this is saying that you know, if we want to know how this evolves over time, we just look at how this probability distribution changes with, with respect to the variable of interest, v, um, and then times a, which is back in the equation, um, the, equi the master equation. OK. So the full fokker planck equation then has the term for the drift, or the deterministic part, and the term for the diffusion, or the noisy part. And you add that all together, and now you have an equation that tells you how the probability distribution evolves over time. So I just want to point this out to make it very clear that we have two different equations here. We have one that is our model, which says how these, this variable v changes over time. Then we have one that asks, what is the probability of v? So you know, v taking some value, and this explains how that evolves over time. These are both very useful equations to keep in mind when you're analyzing these sort of stochastic differential equations. OK, more generally, we can write out you know, the Fokker-Planck equation for the uh, arbitrary function of f and g, and um, here it is in it, all its glory. OK, so now let's talk about a more specific model that has been useful to neuroscience, and it's just what we call a leaky integrate and fire neuron. So now V is going to represent the voltage of our neuron. Then we're going to look at uh, this equation, which has a term that we can um, interpret as the leak conductance of this neuron, and then a term which is the voltage of this neuron, a term which is the resting potential, so where it would leak to if it wasn't getting input. Um, something about the inputs coming into the system that could change over time. And then we have the, the noise term, right? The, the eta that still sticks around. So we can run the simulation of this. And you know, we get several different trajectories that you know, if you were sort of paying attention earlier, you might expect this in general. And on average, you get something that looks like an ordinary differential equation. Um, but there's a problem here, right? Like, 
this is supposed to be a neuron, so where are the spikes? Well, turns out that if you just apply a threshold, and every time you cross that threshold, you say the neuron fired a spike, you can get something pretty good. So the way you actually implement this is you, every time you cross threshold, you say there's a spike, and then you reset to a uh, given um, potential that you set in your model, and then you keep running it, and you can get spikes over time. So that's one trajectory, right? Yes. This is a one single instantiation of this. Um, OK, so just one thing I want to point out about this is I actually set this up so that if there was no noise, you would have never crossed this threshold. So there is a, a common theory of cortical neurons which says that you know, they don't actually have um, super threshold inputs. They have subthreshold inputs, and noise actually drives the spikes we see. And it, it works out, actually, that if you look at, say, an MT neuron, and look at its spikes over um, just a constant motion input, you get something that looks very irregular and Poisson-like, and this model can actually capture that. So that's why this model is useful. OK. So we've introduced a problem by introducing this, uh, this threshold, though. Um, more generally, we call this a boundary condition, which just means once you hit some boundary, you do something that's not really normal. You say, well, instead of keeping going on this drift, we're going to take the voltage and we're going to shoot it down there. So if we stick with our normal Fokker-Planck equation, it turns out that we won't conserve our probability, right? We, if we just keep iterating this, then every time it V goes out of there or above the threshold, then we lose some probability and over time our, you know, it wouldn't sum to 1. And we, we need our probability distributions to sum to 1, otherwise they don't make sense. So we have to augment this equation. And the way we do that is actually we, we, we pay attention to what's going on really close to this threshold. And the, the basic answer is we just ask how frequently, or the flux, of crossing that threshold. And it turns out to be really related to the, the, the noise term. Um, so I'm not going to go into the math of that. But the point is. To write down the full Fokker-Planck equation now, we have to have the original term, which you know, I introduced before, and then a term that says every time we're going above threshold, we have to take out probability, so that's the minus here, and then add it back at the point of reset. Okay, So that, that keeps our, our total probability equal to 1. OK. So Here is an example of where this was useful in neuroscience. Um, it's work by Pello et al., done in 2005 in the Journal of Neuroscience. And basically, they were looking at retinal ganglion cells and giving these cells a, a varying light input, which is expressed up here, and then recording the spikes. Now, using this model, they were able to actually make some inference about what the underlying voltage is. You know, they weren't intracellularly recording from this neuron, so they have no idea. But from the spikes and from the stimulus, they were able to infer what this voltage distribution looks like over time. And then they could use that information to say, well, given there was a spike over here, what is the probable time of the next spike? And you know, you, according to the model, it was very probable to happen here, not so much in between, and also pro somewhat probable will happen later. And if you look at the data, it turns out that this model predicts that time of the next spike really well. OK. So that is about it. I, um, yeah, I, I do have one more example. And this is just very general. I'm not going to talk about any spe specifics. But um, I wanted to point out that this, uh, the ideas behind this is used very generally in science as well as neuroscience. So if we want to talk about, you know, behavioral data that I might have. I actually use this in, in, my, day, in my everyday work. Um, we can express, um, we can ask how people are inferring the state of some variable x as it changes over time based on some noisy measurements y. And I just want to point out that we use these uh, different stochastic differential equations to model this portion, 
And then we also have a second part of the model, which you know, is an observation model, we call it. And it just says, you know, what are the observations? How do they relate to x? But th the main point is, if we understand the stochastic differential equations, we can understand this part. And understanding this part isn't so difficult. Yep? Um, in there, this is fully general, right? You can choose your um, observation model to change over time, um, much like you can choose your transition model here to change over time. So at any given time point, um, just going back to the sort of very beginning, you can see the, the most general sort of way of writing this is the, the function can change as a, as a function of time. Yeah, and that's, that holds for observation models as well. Um, OK, so are there any questions in general? Or you know, give you just enough to be dangerous here? OK, well, that's really pretty much all I have. Um, I think these will be posted online, so there's a list of suggested readings at the end. But um, yeah, that's what I got. Um, questions and or practice set. Evan? What's the observation model? <laughs> it's just. It's a model describing the statistical dependence of your observations to the underlying process, the x. Oh, okay, I get it. So it's, you know, probability of y given x is some value. Yeah, exactly. I didn't use those terms because I didn't want to just introduce new terms, but that is exactly a hidden Markov model. Ah, uh, that's a very good question, actually. So turns out that items like the Fokker-Planck equation, um, they become very computationally expensive because you have to figure out those partial differential equations for every variable and every combination of those variables. That's um, mm, So when you get to this. You can't see, sorry. When you get to this item here, you have to evaluate that relative to every other variable as well. So it wouldn't just be um, d, d, v squared. You have to do d, d, v, 1, d, v, 2, d, d, v, 1, d, d, v, 3, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it turns out in practice, the best way to sort of get a good intuition about what's going on is just to simulate it. Um, but in the cases where there are analytical solutions, especially Gaussians, um, linear Gaussian systems, they, they have been extremely helpful. And that's where like the common filter, for example, comes from. Anything else? OK. I strongly recommend you guys check out the probability or the problem set. Um, it has ways to simulate these sort of processes and some more math that's fun.